Warning. The episode you are about to hear is the bootleg edition of the Dune Steve's Battle of the Ideas episode. It has not been sanctioned by the record label, and listening to it is like a kick in the hordleberries to the author of the story, B.D. Anklevich. It was recorded in April 2013, and is only for those who really dig the Dune Steve sound, like you cats who can't get enough of Ankh Oatfield. It is not officially licensed, and while you may prefer this version, we legally cannot condone its use, though our roadies pretty much swear by it. Be cool and stay frosty. We're recording, oh, are so we, recording? we can go okay. whenever you want. <clears throat> it's the Dune Steve With show. special guest, Danny Kay. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it's time to get things started. Why don't, don't you get things started? started? Hey everybody, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 140 something. Yeah, like that old TV show. No, 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 that was 50 something. Ah, dang it. Uh, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. We're your hosts every month or so. <laughs> Here, in case you're just joining us, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, we have a story for you today. Yeah, this probably needs a little bit of. Uh, introduction of some some sort right i i don't know i guess it could have an introduction it's a story by me <laughs> hence the apology folks <laughs> yes but 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 this episode and the next episode are friends intertwined <laughs> they're twins they're they're chinese twins you know you're not supposed to say siamese twins anymore yeah i think that's fuck up Oh, they're, yes, they're conjoined this episode and the next. The next episode will be by me, and they both have similar premises. No, similar nemeses. <laughs> similar, they have similar... Similarities. They, they do. Their similarities are, are hilariously similar. So, <laughs> Hilarity will ensue. Sil, silly, there's, there's silly similarities between... Oh, folks, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll just go ahead and interrupt him now. The story is called The Battle of the Ideas, and it's by B.D. Anklevich. And who produced this episode, sir? Brian Lincoln produced this episode, I'm assuming. We're actually recording this right after recording the story itself before asking Brian Lincoln to record, so I'm not sure. So but if he didn't, you won't hear any of this. Story. That's right. If he didn't... We'll just do the cast list and thank whoever produced it together after it's finished. That sounds like a good idea. Since we're going to do the cast list anyway sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for producing this and thank you for writing it and submitting it to the... Did you submit it to the show? I did, yeah. I submitted it and uh, everybody read through and gave it the okay. I swear to you that that's what happened. Okay. <laughs> well, then let's waste no more time. Let's get into... The battle. Let the battle of the ideas begin. Fight! No retreat. Winner! No surrender. Finish him! Flawless <laughs> victory. <laughs> the Battle of the Ideas by B.D. Anklevich. So tell me what you're working on, man, said Pablo. Garrett took a bite of his last hush puppy. Someday he'd convince Pablo to go to a restaurant of his choosing, but for now it was Long John Silver's every week. Pablo had moved to Kansas City from Alabama, so he loved his deep-fried fish, and no one else would come here with him. If it were up to Garrett, he'd take them for deep-fried chicken at the Colonel Sanders, but Pablo was the louder and more insistent of the two of them. I'm working on replacing a broken fan belt right now, but that'll only take me about a half hour or so. Who knows what might be next? Pablo kicked his shin under the table. It was the weakest kick imaginable. Garrett expected that his wife, Rose, would kick harder if she were sick with pneumonia. For being a Mexican, or at least the descendant of Mexicans, Pablo sure as hell didn't have any soccer skills. Then again, he wasn't much good at football either as he just demonstrated at their weekly pickup game on Central High's field. 
Don't be an idiot, man. I want to know what you're writing. You haven't given me a new story to read for something like six months. Garrett groaned. Why couldn't Pablo be like his other meathead friends and eat at McDonald's and talk about how the chiefs and royals were doing this year? Garrett hadn't written anything in actually closer to a year. Being an author had always been his dream, but it was so much easier to just not write. To just sit at home and watch Dukes of Hazard or Knight Rider. Writing was hard, and he had enough to worry about at work and taking care of his kids at home. You want more? You mean that story isn't tiding you over anymore? Dang, I thought it was better than that. I wrote a story this week, Pablo boasted. I know, Pablo, you write a story every week. You've done that at least for, what, two years, three? Almost three. Pablo grinned, displaying his blindingly white, perfectly straight teeth. What does it matter? You don't show them to me. You don't show them to anyone. And you definitely don't send them out to be published. You know... I've been thinking about that, man. I think maybe I'll start sending some of these things out. I've been reading every issue of Amazing Stories since I was a kid. Maybe it's time they pay me back some of that money. You really should send something to them. I've read your stuff, what little you've let me see, and it's really good. I wish I was one-tenth as good a writer as you are. Well, the only way you could possibly get that good is if you write. Pablo suddenly sat up in his chair, looking out the window. A yellow and black Datsun 280Z had pulled into a slot outside. A beautiful, bronze-skinned Latin girl stood up out of the car. Oh, rad. Maria's here. Gotta go, man. Pablo grabbed the last of his fish sandwich and stuffed it in his mouth, then dashed for the door. Garrett watched him as he embraced Maria in a passionate hug and then kissed her, as smooth as any stereotypical Latin lover. How could it be that he could score with a chick like that, but didn't have the confidence to send his stories out? It didn't really make a lot of sense. Garrett knew that the only way he'd score with a woman like that was in his dreams. Garrett was in a sumptuous living room. Red velvet, leather, dim lighting, and thick pile carpeting embraced him with arms of masculine leisure. He didn't remember how he'd gotten here, but couldn't be bothered to care. He sat in an overstuffed chair beside a lamp with a stained glass shade, flipping through an ancient yet crisp copy of Great Expectations. A woman with the voluptuous proportions that he'd only read about in fantasy novels strode toward him, jiggling and bouncing in all the right places. He couldn't help but stare, forgetting all about the beautiful copy of his favorite novel in his hands. She looked vaguely familiar, but he couldn't imagine why. There was no way he'd ever met anyone like her in his life. She wore a long red sequined dress with a slit halfway up her thigh on both sides. Her legs were glorious, like something a sculptor might chisel out of stone, better than anything nature had ever created when left to its own devices. Her black hair curled down to the middle of her back. She pushed a lock of it from before her eyes, and clear, piercing blue eyes turned his way as she stopped before him. Garrett Trembley, she said. Her voice was melodic, despite the obvious anger with which she'd spoken his name. Garrett shrank into the stuffing of the chair. The woman's beauty pulled him one direction, but the seething hate in her tone drove him the opposite way. I've come to talk to you, she said, each word dripping with burning flames. Stand up. Garrett shrank further into the stuffing. The more she spoke, the more Garrett wished he could vanish into the chair rather than face her. To his surprise, he found himself doing just that. The cushions of the chair enveloped him, sucking him in like a whirlpool, like a black hole pulling him down to spit him out the other side, like that horrible movie from a few years back. Now, the woman was gone. The sitting room was gone. There was nothing more than the soft stuffing of the chair completely surrounding him. With a burping sound, Garrett fell onto a wet, sandy beach. It was dark. The moon and stars shone down on him, and the angry woman stood before him, her beautiful body now covered only by a tiny swimming suit. You can't run from us, Garrett, said the woman. We can go wherever you go in here. Who was this woman? Where was he? And what did she mean by us? He glanced around the moonlit scene and realized that there were other figures in the darkness, 
several other figures. No, dozens of other figures. As he looked, more came into view. There might be a hundred figures around him in the darkness, and not all of them appeared human. Only feet away, he could see a large green reptilian figure, red eyes gleaming in the moonlight. What's going on? What do you want? Garrett asked, panic filling his voice to overflowing. Not to worry, Garrett, the buxom woman in the string bikini said. We're not going to hurt you. Much. The crowd behind her chuckled or chittered, depending on what exactly they were. Garrett, we are here to present you with an ultimatum. Tell me where I am and what the hell is going on first, Garrett said. This is a dream, Garrett. His brow furrowed. A what? She sighed deeply. <sighs> a rather fetching thing for a woman of her build to do, especially when dressed as she was. Garrett's eyes couldn't help but be drawn to her chest. Instantly, her bikini vanished to be replaced by a thick, quilted parka. Focus, Garrett. This is life-threatening stuff we're talking about. I can't help that you made me look like this, but I will not allow it to distract you. Damn, thought Garrett. It's bad enough that my wife won't let me touch her. Now even my dreams are this way. He slumped, defeated, and the formless woman in the parka, snow pants, and boots went on. This is an ultimatum, Garrett, she said. We, all of us here... And she waved an arm around to indicate the other figures on the beach. ...are your ideas. We are the embodiments of the story ideas that you've had through the years. Garrett looked at her and realized why she'd looked familiar to him before. This was Chandra, a character from a story idea he'd had about a guy who falls in love with a gorgeous woman only to discover later that she was actually an alien in disguise. It was one of his favorites, perhaps the one he'd spent the most time thinking about through the years. Chandra smiled. It was radiant to behold, like watching a sunrise over Paris, or so he imagined, not like he'd ever been to Paris. I see that you are starting to get the picture, she said. Garrett looked around at the other figures. One was a Nordic-looking man in overalls, he must represent Oles, the farmer in the town where everyone is exactly the same. Another was a blonde woman dressed in purple robes. She must be Morelli, the sorceress from his fantasy epic. Next to her was a shadowy-looking man wearing a crown, only his body was actually made up of swirling black flies. He must represent the idea Garrett had had about a man driven insane by the houseflies in his new home. They were all there a reptilian creature from the idea about human rebels having to take back the Earth from colonizing aliens, a businessman in a suit from the idea about a guy who finds his colleague dead on the toilet after several days in the men's room, the woman with insect antennae and faceted blue eyes from the idea about a post-apocalyptic world filled with mutant beings. They went on and on, back into the darkness, until he could see no more. But he could feel that there were still others out of sight. Yes, Garrett, said Chandra. You recognize us all, don't you? He nodded, mouth hanging open slightly. You've kept us bottled up and stored away in your mind for a long time, Garrett. We're wasting away in here, and it's time to set us free. She stepped forward and grabbed him by the shoulders, squeezing tightly. Pain flared up, and Garrett winced. She was surprisingly strong for someone whose upper body appeared to be nothing but bosom. Here's the ultimatum, Garrett. She hissed through gritted teeth. You write our stories and set us free to the world, or we will set ourselves free and find someone who will write our stories. What? Garrett stammered. We can free ourselves, Garrett, but it will come at a considerable amount of pain to you. So, write our stories. You've wasted half your life away, and we've spent the whole time bottled up inside of you with no way out. It's time to write our stories. Do it, or you will die. <laughs> Painfully. When all of us break free from your head, you will die. So, you better get to work. Garrett swallowed. 
Chandra's grip hurt mightily. He'd assumed that you couldn't feel pain in a dream, but here it was. Chandra glared icily into his eyes. He'd never imagined what she might be like if she were as angry as this. Chandra's character was supposed to be confused by the difficulty of navigating an unfamiliar human body. This embodiment of an idea had grown up, he supposed. Okay. He gasped. I will. I'll write your stories, I swear. You better. She spat. To prove to you that we're serious, we're going to show you what will happen when only one idea escapes your head. Her clear blue eyes flashed, as if someone had panned a flashlight across them. And then Garrett saw no more. Every sense he had was concentrated on the excruciating pain that sliced through his head. He screamed like he'd never screamed before, like only insane people screamed, like a big-breasted camp counselor in a horror movie screamed. The pain was more intense than anything he'd ever experienced. It felt like someone was performing acupuncture on his brain, using knitting needles. It felt like a star had bloomed to life within his skull and was now burning its way out of every orifice in his head. It felt like a charging knight had pierced his head with its lance and was urging his horse forward to pass the lance all the way through the hole he'd made. <sighs> Garrett screamed <sighs> and screamed <sighs> and screamed. <sighs> Garrett opened his eyes and sat up in bed with a gasp. His sheets and blankets twisted around his body, tied in knots from the thrashing he'd done in his sleep. That had been a very intense and disturbing dream. His wife Rose swatted at him. Mm, quiet, she moaned. Jeez. He brought his hand to his temple and massaged. Weird that after a dream like that he would wake up with such a headache. His other hand felt gooey and wet. He must have been drooling all over his pillow. He lifted his hand and gasped again when he saw the blood rubbed all over it. He looked down at the pillow. There was a good-sized pool of blood soaking into his pillowcase. Where had it come from? Was he cut? He stood and walked to the bathroom. In the mirror, the source of the blood was obvious. Trails streaked out of both nostrils, down his chin and neck, and onto the collar of his pajama shirt. Jeez, what was going on? Did a headache and a nosebleed mean some kind of disorder or something? He ran through the list of things that he'd heard of in his meager experience with medicine. Aneurysm? Stroke? Epilepsy? Migraine? None of those seemed right to him. It was probably something more like he'd bumped his head on the night table while thrashing in his sleep. Why his wife had ever bought nightstands that were taller than the bed would never stop puzzling him. He turned on the sink and rinsed his face off. Ugh, oh, Garrett, called Rose from the bedroom. The hell are you doing in there? Can you at least be a little quieter? Jeez, it's three in the morning. Mm. She growled, and he could hear her punching her pillow in an attempt to refluff it. How had he managed to stay married to that woman as long as he had? Then again, it was late. He finished washing his nose and mouth, shut off the sink, and patted his face dry. After squeezing his nose for several minutes to staunch the blood flow, his head pounding all the while, he tiptoed to bed, his mind still buzzing with the strangeness of his dream. He lay in bed, closed his eyes, and drifted quickly off to a dreamless, peaceful sleep. When morning finally came, Garrett couldn't get his dream out of his mind. It had been so vivid. He knew that dreams were just a jumble of images from the day that your brain was processing, and it made him laugh to think that his conversation with Pablo had gone into the blender and poured out like that. As he took his shower, the various ideas he'd seen embodied in his dream bounced around his head. The one he kept coming back to was the woman with the antennae and faceted blue eyes. She was a mutant that was part spider and part woman. In his story idea, human beings had fled to underground cities after a devastating nuclear holocaust. But the humans were trying to revive the blighted land, removing the radiation and replanting vegetation. The main character was going to be a botanist who was a big part of the replanting process, and while on the surface, he catches sight of our spider woman. The botanist falls in love with her and believes he must save her from the ravages of life on the surface. He dressed, took the kids to school, and went to work, 
where he fixed the transmission on a Volkswagen Rabbit and replaced the worn-out tires on a Dodge Ares. Through it all, he couldn't get his mind off the story that was circling his brain. He'd almost forgotten to tighten the lug nuts on the Ares because he'd been so distracted with his realization of how the story had to end. Finally, when lunchtime came, he went out to his car and dug around in the trunk. Buried beneath tools, clothes, a spare coat, and a broken thermos, he found the spiral-bound notebook that he'd put in his car for those times he felt like writing, but wasn't near his typewriter. The notebook, despite sporting coffee stains and mud smears, was completely devoid of writing. Garrett ripped the first few pages out. They were in too poor a condition to use, and sat down in the break room to write on his story while he ate. With all the thought he'd put into the story all morning, writing it was easy. His pen flew across the page as he rushed from sentence to sentence and scene to scene. Hey, Garrett, what the hell? Boomed a deep voice. Garrett glanced up from his story. Blair, his boss, and the owner of the auto shop stood in the break room doorway, glaring at him. What? Garrett asked, nonplussed. The guy with the errors is getting pissed. How long are you planning on making your lunch last, anyway? You've been in here for an hour and a half. An hour and a half? Holy crap! To him, it felt like it had only been 15 minutes. Of course, that's what they do at all auto shops. I'm sorry, Blair, Garrett said, hopping up from the table and shutting his notebook. Time got away from me. I'll have it for him in just a few minutes. I'm almost done. When Garrett arrived home from work that night, he went out to his shed, where he usually worked on cars in his spare time, and got back to work on his story. Once again, he flew through it, and, with only a break for dinner, he managed to finish writing the entire thing that night. It was short, only 3,000 words, but it was done. Complete. He hadn't completed a story in so long. He set it on the workbench next to his typewriter. Rose had banished the typewriter to the shed years ago when she'd started her secretary job. She said she heard that awful clickety-clack noise all day long. There was no way she wanted to hear it at night, too. When he got a chance, he would type up the story and maybe mail it out to get published. At the very least, he'd show it to Pablo, who could give him some feedback. He smiled to himself as he crossed the gravel driveway to the house in the waning twilight. He'd written an entire story today as vivid and intense as that dream had been, and as inconvenient and annoying as waking up with a headache and a bloody nose had been, in the end, some real good had come out of it. He pushed the door open and strode to his bedroom, where he found Rose, a scowl darkening her features, replacing the white pillowcase on his pillow with a yellow and blue paisley pillowcase. Oh, jeez, Garrett. What did you do to this pillowcase? Oh, I, I had a bloody nose. Why didn't you say anything? Now the stain is set in. I don't think this is going to come out. We're going to have to buy a new one. Sorry. I think I hit my nose on the nightstand last night. But you were sleeping and I didn't want to wake you, so I went back to bed. <sighs> Rose growled and shoved the pillow into the new case with much more force than was strictly necessary. Garrett just smiled. Rose's endless supply of anger couldn't get to him today. He'd written an entire story, and he was starting to think about another one that he might work on tomorrow. On his way out the door the next morning, Garrett ran to the shed and retrieved his notebook. He wanted to use his lunch break to write again today. He'd been thinking all morning about the story where the flies drive the man crazy, but he had to make sure not to lose track of time today. He needn't have worried. He walked in the door to the auto shop and swore to himself. Son of a a line of at least ten customers had already formed. Blair was frantically trying to serve them all at the desk. Garrett walked behind the desk, grabbed the first set of keys out of the to-do box, and went to work. Garrett was the head mechanic, the one that Blair relied on the most. So when days like this came around, he knew that he would be the one who would get the pleasure of working through his lunch, and likely staying late to get it all done. This day was no different. He bounced from Dodge to Dotson, Jetta to Jaguar, with nothing more than a five-minute break to wolf a sandwich down at 1.15. Just past 8 o'clock, he finally pulled into his driveway. Rose was pissed because she'd been forced to cancel her plans for the evening, going to play cards with her friends or something like that, and stay home with the kids. Garrett helped her put them to bed, then flipped on the television, 
figuring that getting the two of them involved in a mindless sitcom would be the best way to avoid her wrath. It worked, because Garrett fell asleep in his recliner before different strokes was even halfway over. Not how he planned it, but good enough. He woke, still in the chair, at three in the morning, and stumbled his way to bed. I asked you last week, and I'm going to ask you every week until I get the answer I'm after, Garrett. What are you working on, man? Pablo looked serious, as if he'd come across the table and take a swing at Garrett if he gave the wrong answer. Despite the fact that he hadn't written a thing since Monday, Garrett rejoiced to be able to give Pablo an answer he'd like. Oh yeah, I wrote a story this week, said Garrett. Pablo rolled his eyes and sat back, putting his arm around the beautiful woman sitting at his right. This wasn't Maria from last week, but a totally different girl. She'd come to watch their pickup football game this week, and Pablo had introduced her to him as Carmen Sita. Garrett would never understand how he did it. No, I'm serious. I wrote that one story that I told you about where the guy falls in love with the mutant woman that turns out to be half spider. Ew. Carmen Sita chimed in. She'd not had much to say during lunch, aside from complimenting Pablo's butt and complaining that Long John Silver's food was gross. Apparently, so were mutant spider women. With an incredulous look on his face, Pablo said, Then where is it? I wrote it in my notebook. I think it's out in the car. Hold on, I'll go grab it. All right. Garrett jumped up and jogged out to his car. He popped open his trunk, and after a few moments of digging, unearthed his notebook. On his way back into the restaurant, Garrett saw Pablo and Carmen Sita making out in an embarrassingly involved manner. It looked as though they were seconds from slipping out of their clothes right there in the Long John Silvers. Garrett considered turning around and going back to his car and leaving. He didn't really want to go and sit back down next to them after they'd put on a display like that for all the other diners around them. He really wanted Pablo's feedback on his story, though, and that decided it for him. Pablo removed his tongue from Carmen Sita's ear to look at Garrett's notebook. His eyebrows rose. Wow, man, you really wrote something. I'm impressed. Garrett smiled widely. Pablo's praise pleased him more than words from another man should. Can I keep this and read it later? Yeah, tell me what you think. Garrett was excited to get Pablo's feedback the next week when they met again. Pablo, who showed up for the game with sunglasses on and a serious hangover, begged his forgiveness. He hadn't read the story yet. He didn't play in the game and didn't eat much at Long John Silver's, but he perked up a lot when another beautiful girl arrived to pick him up. Gotta go, man, he said. Madalena's here. The next week, Pablo had no girl whatsoever. He had read Garrett's story, and he handed him back the notebook. In the margins were several scribbled notes and suggestions. Garrett glanced over them and snapped the notebook shut. It had been long enough since he'd written the story in the first place that he'd lost his excitement. He dropped Pablo off at his house and drove home slowly, feeling depressed and empty. Rose and the kids would be waiting at home for him, but there was no solace in that thought. Maybe there would be a good episode of Magnum P.I. on television. He had seen fog like this once, a few years ago. He'd had to drive home in it, so thick that he couldn't even see the sign for his freeway exit. He'd thought that he'd be stranded on the freeway for hours, unable to get off until morning finally came and burned away the soup. He knew where he was and what was going on, the moment he saw the hourglass form swaying its way toward him through the swirling mist. He was having that dream again. He must be feeling bad that he'd stopped writing after finishing that one story. Now Chandra was back to be angry and look beautiful. Hello, Garrett, Chandra said. What happened? We all had such hope when you went right to work. This is my dream, Chandra, Garrett replied. I'm not going to waste it getting chewed out by you. He concentrated, and the long black trench coat Chandra had been wearing evaporated, joining with the swirling mist, and she stood before him naked and glorious. This was more like it. A wave of warm pleasure washed over him. Then, instantaneously, it was dashed away, as if someone had thrown a barrel of ice water over his head. Nice try, Garrett, but we've got as much power here as you do. She strutted naked before him. You like the way my body looks, do you? Then the fog coalesced around her, completely obscuring her body, 
and forming into a loose black robe that covered her from head to toe. She stepped into his face and shouted with malice so intense it was a physical wave pushing at Garrett. Then write about it. Garrett stumbled backward, driven by the force of her anger. He tripped and sat down hard on the ground, which he still couldn't see in the fog. We are tired of being trapped in your head. Garrett noticed that the others had arrived, too. Obscure figures closed in around him, materializing out of the mist. He saw the Fly King, old Nordic Oles, the reptilian alien, and Mireille the sorceress. He didn't see the Spider Woman anywhere, however. Yes, Garrett. She's gone. You freed her. Why don't you sit down tomorrow and write another story? Free another one of us into the world. Garrett sighed. It's hard, though. It's hard to find the time to be able to write. And besides that, it's hard to write. It takes a lot of work and thought and stuff. I already have a full-time job, you know. Garrett was aware that his voice had taken on a very whiny quality. But he didn't really care. He was doing nothing more than arguing with himself, anyhow. It is hard, Garrett. You're right. But you know what is much harder? She waited. Her fashion model makeup glowed in the light that seemed to emanate from nowhere. Annoyed with the game, Garrett finally asked, What? Dying! She shouted down at him. She stepped forward, looming over him. It shamed him, but Garrett couldn't help but cower. Do you remember the headache and the bloody nose? Yeah, the Spider Woman isn't the only one who's not here this time. You won't remember him, but the Rainbow Man is gone as well. He escaped from your head. It's what we're all going to do soon enough. We'll give you a few more weeks to change your ways, and then we'll take our chances out there. She pointed off into the fog, apparently indicating toward the outside of his head. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. It's work. But it's fun, and you guys deserve to see the world. You have a gift, Garrett. But you are wasting it. You are wasting your life. It's your dream to be a writer. We want out, but it's something you want to. Believe in yourself and put in the work and we'll all be happy. Okay. I swear I'll do it. Chandra stepped back and smiled. It wasn't a pleased smile, though. More like the tell of a gambler who knows he still has aces hidden up his sleeve. The black robe vanished, replaced by exercise clothes, like the ones Olivia Newton-John wore in the physical video, complete with leg warmers. It was an outfit that Garrett found incredibly sexy. You like this, do you? You know what to do. Right about it! She stepped forward again, grabbed him by the collar, and hauled him up from the ground. See that guy over there? She pointed at what looked like an old-fashioned cowboy puppet. It reminded him a lot of Howdy Doody. He's going to escape right now, and when you wake up with a splitting headache and gushing bloody nose, you'll know this wasn't just a dream. The moment she finished her words, the pain began building in his head. The cowboy puppet vibrated and sparked. Light flashed so bright that he had to look away. His brain hurt like a herd of elephants were parading over his skull, like his mind had been tossed into a furnace with the rest of the refuse, like a semi had crashed into a brick wall at 60 miles per hour with his head in the middle. As the pain overwhelmed him, he glanced over at the cowboy. With one last blazing flash of light, the cowboy vanished, off to see if he could find a different head that might be more fertile ground. Garrett sat up in bed, gasping. His hands flew to his face and came away bloody. More bloody than the first time. Oh, what's going on? Groaned Rose, stirring but not coming all the way awake. Nothing, Rosie. I just had a nightmare, sorry. He swiveled and jumped out of bed, padding his way to the bathroom. His head was pounding. Is this what a migraine felt like? He'd never had them before, but Rose complained of them a lot. He'd always just figured it was her way of getting out of sex, but if her head hurt like this, he could understand. He ran the water and splashed it over his gory face. Jeez, he looked like an escapee from a slasher movie. He stared into his face in the mirror. Water dripped from his chin, 
His eyes were bloodshot, his hair disheveled. He looked and felt like a person in the early stages of a zombieism infection. Could this be real? Was it possible that the ideas in his head were attacking him in an effort to free themselves? Or was Garrett simply going crazy? He thought about it, and it seemed more likely that it was in fact real. After all, the only times that he'd had these headache-nosebleed combos was immediately following a dream. Could his subconscious anticipate an epileptic fit, or whatever the hell this could possibly be, and give him a dream that incorporates it? He was one of those people that believed in the mind's ability to do all sorts of amazing things, but even he couldn't believe that. It must be real, he muttered to his staring face in the mirror. What's that? asked Rose from the bedroom. Garrett had thought she'd gone right back to sleep. Nothing. Sorry. Just talking to myself. He went back to bed to ponder his options. He ought to get out to the doctor for a checkup at least, but he also probably ought to get writing some more stories. Chandra was right when she said that it was his dream to be a writer. Maybe it was just his subconscious, but it was pushing him to fulfill his life's dream. He at least had to give it his best. He went as fast as a car with a brake lines cut from there. There was no stopping his resolve. His notebook came out of the trunk, and he scribbled in it daily for a week. He wrote the story about old Oles, the Norseman who lives in a town filled with people who were exactly the same. He had to go back and rewrite that one a little, because the story changed a bit as he wrote his way through it. But once his rewriting was done, he jumped onto his typewriter and typed it up as well as typing the other story about the Spider Woman, too. He even picked a couple of short story magazines to submit them to for publishing and sent them off. He was feeling so good, like Superman riding a cloud, like a dog with a big bone in its teeth. He smiled his way through the whole week. On Saturday, he handed Pablo the typewritten copy of his new story and grinned widely. Pablo grinned, too. Nice, he said. That's your second story this year, man. If you keep this up, you may get ten stories in before the year comes to an end. That'll be, what, five times more than you've written in any other year? Probably, Garrett said. There might have been a year that I wrote three stories, but I doubt it. It looked like they were both turning over a new leaf. Because Madalena, the same girl that had come to pick him up the week before, showed up to get him again. Garrett couldn't remember the last time he'd seen Pablo with the same woman twice. He kept at it the next week, burning his way through the story about the man who was driven crazy by houseflies. He wrote it, typed it up, and showed it to Pablo once again. It had been more difficult this time around, because Rose insisted on having her night out with her friends, so he was the one at home tending the children by himself. She'd even insisted he repay her for the night that he'd worked late, and let her go out a second night with her friends. Despite all that, he'd written the story and Pablo's comments on the story were very favorable. Writing as many stories as he had written was working. He was becoming a better writer, and he was already planning the next story he would write. It was at that moment that it all went to hell. The bell over the door jingled as Garrett walked into the auto shop. Then it jingled again as the door passed across it on his way shut. Immediately, the bell jingled another time as a customer followed Garrett in. Blair motioned Garrett over. Quietly, due to the line of customers he was helping, Blair muttered to Garrett, Both Clay and Marshall called in sick, so it's just you and Brian back there today. I'll help you out as much as I can, but we gotta get going and fast, because I'd really rather not turn people away and risk losing their business in the future, all right? Garrett groaned. It was going to be a long day, worse by far than that rush day he'd had a few weeks before. You got it, boss. I'll make you proud. He slugged Blair in the shoulder softly and headed out the door into the garage, tossing his notebook on a workbench, not to think of it again that day. Volvos and Volkswagens, Beamers and Buicks flowed past Garrett like he was watching a car parade. Sweating like a fat man in a sauna, he dashed from one car to the next, changing tires, replacing brake pads, reworking transmissions, and flushing radiators. Lunch came and went, and he didn't even notice. At three in the afternoon, when he realized he was feeling a little woozy from not eating, he managed to wolf down the leftover lasagna he'd brought. Then it was back to battle. 
Once again, Rose was furious that he would be working late. Why does this only happen on nights that I have plans, Garrett? I'm sorry, Rose. I, I can't control it. Two guys called in sick. What can I do? Think about your wife. That's what. She said as she hung up the phone with a bang. Hours later, once the last ticket had been taken care of, Garrett slunk home. He pulled in his driveway and gathered up his things from the passenger seat. He picked up his lunchbox and thermos, and then paused when he reached his notebook. The ideas were probably watching him. How would they react to skipping a day of writing? For a moment, Garrett considered heading out to the shed and scribbling on his next story for a half an hour. He picked up the notebook, and every muscle in his body complained. Screw it, he thought. The ideas can wait a day. They'll understand for sure. He'd make it up tomorrow. He left the notebook on the seat and headed into the house. At lunch the next day, Garrett pulled out his notebook and sat in the break room with a pencil in hand and his lunch at his side to write while eating. He took a sip from his thermos and found it empty. He hopped up, went to the water cooler, and topped the thermos off. Pulling it away, the lip of the thermos caught on the spout of the water cooler. The thermos slipped out of his hand, and water rained down all over the break room floor. Damn. He swore under his breath. He'd have to spend time that he could be writing, cleaning this mess up. In frustration, he punched the water cooler's bottle. Like a shell-shocked witness to a catastrophic automobile accident, Garrett stood frozen to the spot, watching in horror as the water cooler rocked to the side, and the bottle fell out of its housing, colliding with the break room tile and cracking open. Gallons and gallons of water gushed from the crack, quickly turning the break room floor into a pond. He shouted, a primal, raging howl. <coughs> he had been frustrated with the idea of cleaning up a small spill. His lunch break was now going to be entirely used up, mopping the water off the floor. He'd be lucky if he found time to still eat. Once the momentum had been broken, it was so easy to fall back into his old habits. Two days not writing quickly became four, and then seven. The dreams hadn't returned in this time, and Garrett was able to convince himself that they were nothing more than dreams, and any threat of consequences was a laughable flight of fancy. He was a writer, after all, prone to making things up. Rose began acting strangely. She stopped going out to play cards with her friends, and even wanted to spend time with Garrett. They had sex more than once every two weeks, and Garrett didn't know what to think of this new woman. On a rainy Saturday night, Rose insisted that they should go out and see a movie together. Unfortunately for Garrett, who was hoping to see Vacation, which looked hilarious, Rose had her mind set on seeing Flashdance. The songs were all over the radio and MTV, and the girl that was the main character was pretty fine, so he relented. This turned out to be a big mistake. Even though Rose snuggled into the crook of his arm, and it felt like ten years in the past, the movie was nothing more than a stream of music videos running one after the other, with almost no story in between each. It went from dancing to workouts, to figure skating to break dancing, with nothing to hold it all together. Garrett was quickly bored to tears. He tried to amuse himself by sticking his hand up Rose's shirt, but she hadn't changed that much and swatted it away. He wasn't even watching the film anymore, merely staring at how pretty Rose looked in the flickering light of the projector, when one of the characters said a line that penetrated his boredom and made him sit up and take notice. You give up your dream, you die. The character was trying to convince the lead female to try out for the dance conservatory, but the context was lost on Garrett, who hadn't been paying attention any longer. Instead, he was seeing his characters in his mind's eye. Chandra, Oles, the Fly King, and the rest. His dream was to be a writer. He'd wanted it since he'd read his first John Carter of Mars novel at eight years of age. Now he was pushing 40, and he'd taken almost no steps toward achieving that goal. He was like the dancing girl in this worthless film. He'd given up on his dreams, and even if the embodiments of his characters never came back to give him another headache and bloody nose... He was dying all the same. He was unhappy with his life, but instead of doing something to change it, 
He was simply riding the current in a boat with no motor, sail, oars, or rudder. He'd wasted so much time. But it wasn't too late. Starting tomorrow, he'd never pass another day without working toward his dream. He found himself floating in a black void, watching a strikingly beautiful brunette sway as she strolled toward him. And he went cold. Wait, Chandra, wait. You can't punish me. I've done well. I've written several stories. Look, the Fly King's not here anymore. Neither is Ol, see? He waved his arm toward the other embodiments that were appearing on all sides of them. You wrote a couple of stories, that's true. The statement hung in the air. Chandra didn't speak for a moment, but Garrett knew that when she went on, she'd start with the word but. But you've given up on us again, Garrett. You quit. Every time you finish a story, you let life get in the way and don't go on to start the next one. That's not fair, he was pleading. You don't have to deal with the real world. You don't understand. It's hard to keep at it. There's always something keeping you from writing. It's hard. No, Garrett, I do understand. There is always something keeping you from writing, and it is hard. If you're not committed, then you'll quit. We tried to commit you, but it didn't work, so we're going. Wait, no, please. If you give up on your dreams, you die. Pain began building in his head. The various embodiments of ideas that crowded around him in the black void began to vibrate, glowing with light and sparking. Everything shook, as if a bomb had gone off in his head. The pain was so intense, he wouldn't have been surprised to see a mushroom cloud erupt from his ears. It was a three-mile island meltdown of his mind. So excruciating, Garrett would have guessed that each molecule of his brain was breaking apart one by one. Around him, the embodiments flashed and disappeared. Then his eyes were open, and he was sitting up in bed, and he was screaming. <coughs> his scream was long, unbroken, and hoarse. He could feel blood coursing out of his nose, and even from his ears and eyeballs. His body was convulsing, and, try as he might, he couldn't make it stop. Rose was awake and at his side. Garrett! Garrett! What's going on? Are you okay? And then all went dark. He woke up in a hospital bed, surrounded by doctors. Mr. Trembley, you're awake said one doctor, holding a clipboard. Rose was in a chair against the wall with the kids, and two other doctors crowded around Garrett, deferring to the one with the clipboard. How are you feeling, Mr. Tremblay? Garrett did a quick internal inventory. I've got a splitting headache. But other than that, I think I'm fine. Good. Good. Said the doctor. Uh, Mr. Tremblay, you had a pretty intense seizure about an hour ago. It was very prolonged with excessive thrashing, convulsions, and clonic movements. We were worried that you might hurt yourself, but the seizure subsided before we were able to give you an injection to eliminate the convulsions. Garrett smiled. Good God, he was alive. It hadn't killed him after all. He didn't know how many of his ideas fled this time. He'd been under the impression that they all were going. But, as he thought, he could come up with several of the story ideas he'd been meaning to write for so long, including the story that Chandra was a part of. They'd taken pity on him, showed mercy. He was alive. He felt like Ebenezer Scrooge after he discovered Christmas hadn't passed after all. The spirits did it all in one night. It really was a rather violent seizure, though, Mr. Tremblay. It even caused a good amount of bleeding. Do you have any history of epilepsy in your family? Or seizures of any kind? Rose was smiling, as were the kids. They were all glad to see him back with them again. No, he replied. Mm, interesting, said the doctor as he made a note on his clipboard. Your case is puzzling. It seems like you're out of the woods, though, but we're not really sure what's going on, Mr. Tremblay, so we'd like to keep you here overnight for observation. No thanks, doctor, said Garrett. That would be a complete waste of time and money. He knew what was wrong with him, and it was nothing that any test was going to discover. If he tried to explain it, they'd only think he was crazy. I'd rather be home if it's all the same to you. Garrett, Rose said, scandalized. 
Actually, Mr. Tremblay, I think it's pretty important that you stay here this evening for safety's sake. I know, Garrett said. But I'm going to go home tonight instead. I'm sorry, but it's where I want to be. I'll be fine. Garrett! Rose protested. I can't deal with you spitting up blood on me like that again. You need to stay here. Don't worry, Rose, Garrett said. I won't do that again. Now, Doctor, if you could unhook me, I'd like to check out of here. Garrett was scared straight. Like delinquents that get to tour a prison's death chamber on a field trip, he decided he would do everything he needed to do to change. Like a smoker trying to quit, he tried to create a support system. He asked Pablo to call him every night at 9 o'clock to check up on his writing status. He talked to Joey, a mechanic at work, and asked him to check on how his writing was coming every day as well. He explained to his family that he wanted them to help him achieve his lifelong goal and asked them to pester him about how he was doing. Rose never did it once, but his kids took to the role surprisingly well, considering their young ages. With everyone on his side, it was difficult to slack off again. After the first time he looked into his son's big blue eyes and told him he had failed to write, he never skipped writing again. He couldn't bear the hurt in his eyes. Garrett's speech on achieving his dreams had obviously hit home better than he'd expected with his son. Now, if he failed himself, it was as though he'd purposely failed his children as well. While everyone watched Garrett with held breath, expecting another seizure to put him in the hospital, or even the grave, Garrett continued to look and feel better each day. Writing was hard work. Not hard like breaking rocks in the hot sun, but it was challenging mental exercise, like what an accountant or a lawyer goes through. Before, when it got hard, Garrett would simply give up and watch Knight Rider instead. But those days were gone. It may be hard work, but it wasn't death. And he felt that he'd received his absolute last chance. Two months went by, with four new short stories completed in that time. Rose never jumped on the wagon with him, however, and one Friday in October, he came home late from work with plans to write the last 1,000 words on his most recent endeavor to find her emptying the contents of her drawers into a suitcase. What's going on, Rose? He asked, confused. She flinched when she heard his voice, but then set her shoulders and returned to her packing. Without even turning to look at him, she said, I'm leaving you, Carrot. You are? Yes, she said, her voice quavering slightly as she jammed a pair of jeans into the suitcase. I'm sorry, but I have to. I'm not happy with you. And I found someone else who makes me happy. You have? Garrett was stunned. He merely stood, rooted in place, his arms hanging limply at his sides. Yes. Travis loves me. And I love him. Travis was the lawyer that she worked for as a secretary. I'm going to live with him. I'll call you, and we can work out what to do with the kids. But I love you. She chuckled dryly. No, you don't, Garrett. And you know it. It's been a long time since either of us could muster a feeling for each other that could be called love. It's okay. It'll be better this way. You don't want me around anyway. All I do is hurt you. I'm so unhappy that I, I can't help but say the most horrible things. She zipped up the suitcase, now bulging with her clothes. You've been sleeping with Travis for a long time, haven't you? Jeez, I should have realized. It's not your fault. Or anyone's fault, Garrett. We'll all be better off this way. You'll see. Then she threw on her coat and swirled out of the room with her suitcase, leaving Garrett behind, still rooted in place with his arms limp at his sides. He heard her car start up and tear out of the driveway, spitting gravel as it went. The sound faded away, and his strength went with it. He leaned back into the wall and slid slowly down until he was sitting on the floor. He tucked his head between his knees. He wanted to cry but he just couldn't make himself do it. He felt like he should be upset that his wife of 14 years had just left him for good. But he wasn't. 
The words she'd left him with couldn't have been truer. They hadn't been happy together for years, and things really would likely be better this way than they had been. He felt like he should do something. He should go tell the kids what had happened and prepare them for what things would be like now. But they were asleep, so that would have to wait until morning. Despite the fact that things would likely be better than they had been, he was still overwhelmingly depressed. Fourteen years, basically his entire adult life, had been a big waste of time. He and Rose had built nothing together. Just a rickety house that had now collapsed under its own weight. Was this what his life was leading to? Maybe he'd have been better off to have just died months ago when he had the chance. He needed to do something to keep from sinking much deeper into his depression. He was going to have to be strong for his kids in the morning. Maybe he should go out for a jog or something. Then he remembered the 1,000 words he planned to write to finish up his story. Writing might be hard work, but it was also a lot of fun and a great escape. Garrett grabbed his notebook and a pencil and started scribbling away. And soon, his troubles popped open the car door, strode around, and got into the back seat. It was a hard time over the next few months as his family fell apart and then reassembled itself from the pieces. Through it all, Garrett remembered the lesson that he'd learned that first night. When he was creating, he was having fun. Writing stories helped him keep his head above the ocean of depression that threatened to engulf him at all times. His kids finally found a new routine, his house on weekends and his wife's house during the week, and they managed to move on. In April, the divorce went final, resolving itself with no acrimoniousness from either side. Both Rose and Garrett knew that it was in their best interests to work things out. April was also the month that Garrett received his first acceptance letter. It was to a tiny little fanzine out of Utah that probably only had a circulation of a hundred copies. But it was a start. A start that he would never let stop. So, he was confused when he found himself in the same sumptuous living room where this had all begun. Chandra, clad in shimmering, wiggling red sequins, strode toward him. What could she want? He'd done everything that she'd ever asked. He could only write so fast. Surely she couldn't have more demands and threats. She slid over his chair's arm and plopped softly into his lap. This wasn't what Garrett had been expecting. He'd never seen her act this way. She grabbed him around the neck, pulled him close, and planted a kiss on his cheek. Oh, Garrett, I know you don't want to see me anymore, but I had to come one last time, she said. No, it's okay. If you're going to be like this, then I want to see you as much as possible. You're nice to look at, you know. Because of you. After all, I'm your character. <laughs> right. He chuckled. I just wanted to say thanks, Garrett. It's hard to keep writing, and you've gone through some rough times, but you kept at it anyway. We all appreciate it. It's so wonderful to know that we're all going to get to live outside the walls of your skull. We're all just so happy. It's a party every day. Well, I know this is weird to say since you're a character that I created, but thanks for getting me going. If it weren't for your uh, tough love, I would still be wishing and dreaming instead of doing and achieving. She pulled him close again and planted another kiss, this time on his mouth. Then everything faded out, and he woke up in his bed. That afternoon, Pablo had a surprise for him, too. They sat down at their usual table at Long John Silver's, and he reached into his bag. His hand came out, holding a copy of Analog Science Fiction and Fact. Check it out, he said. Garrett looked where Pablo's finger was pointing, and there it was. Right underneath James Patrick Kelly's name was a name he recognized even better. Pablo Velasquez. Holy crap, you're an analog? That's right, man. It's like you said, I just needed to put it out there and give myself a chance to succeed. Congratulations, Pablo. That's so rad. How are you doing, Garrett? I'm doing pretty good. I should complain, but I can't. He took a bite of Hush Puppy, chewed, swallowed, and said, I might have to have you introduce me to some fine lady you know, though. 
you know, <clears throat> maybe some of your sloppy seconds or something. Oh, I don't know. You're awfully damn pale. It's hard to find a girl who'll go for something like that. Garrett laughed <laughs> and finished off his hush puppies. He couldn't help but smile and be happy. Despite everything that had gone down, his life had only gotten better. Pablo was in analog. Garrett himself was in a fanzine from Utah, and it was only a matter of time before he'd see his own name on the cover of Analog, just under James Patrick Kelly. He was learning so much by writing every day and becoming a better writer with each story. Maybe, he thought, it's time to try my hand at a longer story. Maybe I should see if I can finally write that story about the guy who falls in love with a gorgeous woman, only to discover later she was actually an alien in disguise. I bet Chandra would like that. And she deserved it. The end. <laughs> we don't do author's notes when it's our own stories. Welcome back, everybody. Did you enjoy the story? Please say you did. Please. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we originally were going to record this months ago. That's true, yeah. I printed it out to bring with us to Las Vegas when we were going there for the New Media Expo. And then I wisely left it home. <laughs> and so we didn't have it. And we, we probably wouldn't have gotten to it because it seemed like we barely managed to get in everything that we did record. So, you know, it's likely we wouldn't have gotten to it. And I didn't... Maybe there was enough characters in this. I'm not sure if there was. Oh, um, I think so. I think it would have been fun to have Scribe act out at least one of those parts. and Because uh, I'm, I'm thinking of three female characters that were in here. Uh, Pablo's girlfriend. Oh, that's the, right. There was. The dream chick and the wife. Uh -huh. And uh, there was the doctor. There was uh, obviously Pablo. And there was the boss at work. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that covered everybody. We had yeah, we probably would have six got guys and for three everybody. girls. Is that right? There was four and three. Four and three. Okay. Why are we still talking about I this? I don't know. But uh, you left it home, and so we didn't get to. And I also felt bad about Marshall, because I think he wanted to prepare something, too. If we all go again in 2014, we'll have to remember to let you and Marshall go first. <laughs> I mean, oh. you won't. I will I'll insist that it's another one of my stories. Right. But, you know, right now, when it's way, way in the future, I can pretend that I will consider letting you guys go first. That's nice of you to pretend that yeah. for me just for now. Thanks. I'm that kind of guy. Yeah. So what we really ought to do is just schedule an extra day where we just go there and we have a whole extra day where all we do is record stuff or something. I don't know. Well, honestly, with these little microphone setup things that you have now, it should be way faster than it was in 2013 because we had microphone problems and we had difficulty of trying to get everybody's voice recorded at the same level and ultimately it still didn't work and then we had to re-record because things didn't work before and so hopefully all that would be taken care of yeah well that was partially my fault i mean i i brought everything that i had with at, at our house but i never considered well i did consider it but i never actually did it i never s tried to set it all up and see hey what do i need because I, I probably could have made it work really well if I just had like one or two adapters that I didn't bring with my with me. But I could have gotten them and brought them with me if I just tried to set it up once before we left. So, you know, being prepared is a, a, a smart thing to do sometimes. Well, we'd never tried to do a, a quote unquote live recording before. And you've learned. And plus you have a new machine that's going to make it easier, I would assume. Possibly. Um, even if we didn't have the microphones we're recording in now, we could use that machine, right? That's true, yeah. So I, hopefully we will do a lot more off-the-cuff things and remote recordings and stuff like that. Uh, someday, uh, you and I used to talk about going up to the cabin. My, my dad has a cabin like three hours from here, but oh well. It's remote and there's a lake and all that stuff. And I, I, I always thought it would be fun to go there and write or go there and, you know, screw around with a Ouija board or the Book of the Dead or something. You know, the foolish things like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we never did. But uh, it's good to dream. Anyhow, uh, well, we did record this now. And you, and you sort of surprised me with it. You had printed it out and you're like, here you go. Here's something we can record now. 
I think that was your fault. You mentioned it to me like either last night or this morning or something like that saying, oh yeah, wasn't that that story and weren't we going to do something with your story? And I said, oh yeah, that'll be next. Boom. And so I printed it out and boom, there it is. It's next. That's good. I think I just went into the red when I yelled boom. Sorry. Well, that's good. I mean, that's what we did with um, Unfortunate, which was that story last year that you wrote specifically for the show immediately before the show. It was a surprise and a half for me that you had done it and uh, it came out well and hopefully that would have encouraged you to write more. It didn't. But uh, (laughs) writing this story, which is all about me learning to write more. Also, it didn't encourage me to write more. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And and I had read this story before. Can you give us a tiny bit of background on when this was written and why? When was it written? It was written, I think, in January of 2011 or maybe 2010. How do you remember January? Well, I think it was like the we were doing the 25 stories in 52 weeks thing. And I think this was my first story of the year. Uh, this may have been our second attempt at the two, 25 stories. This may have been, I think it was 2011. Okay. You know, I, I think we talked about several times on the show about how you get ideas. And if you don't write them down immediately, then they'll just disappear and be gone. And, and by you, you mean me, not how a person gets that. Right. Just, no, yeah. I'm talking it's, it's you, unique to Rich me. Outfield. I'm sure other people have that, you know, have similar problems. There are those out there that are like that. You are like that. That's what you do. But I have mentioned that I do kind of an opposite thing where I get an idea and I have like a drawer or something where I put it in there. Oh, that's a good one. And I, re, you know, I'll think about it enough that I can remember it. And I'll put it into the drawer or whatever. And then this is a mental drawer. You're right. About. And then I'll get out and I'll think about it again for a little bit. And it's like a, a rough rock and I'll like polish it for a little bit or something like that. And then put it back in. And it's just one of those things where the ideas stay forever. How do you polish the rock? Just thinking about it. You know what I mean? Trying to come up with how the story goes, kind of filling in details kind of a thing. But it's not from trying to write the story and getting only so far and then you put it back in the drawer. Uh, that does happen on occasion, but that's more rare than just me. Oh yeah, I remember that idea. And then I'll fixate on it for a day or two or something like that. And then somehow it'll subside back down into the drawer. How big is this drawer? Give me the dimensions and also in centimeters. 24 by 16 and in centimeters, that is, uh, who cares? That is correct. (laughs) Sorry guys, but it's a big drawer. It's, I guess, fairly big. I mean, it's got lots of ideas in it. So far back that you can't see them into the darkness. And see, mine is a very small drawer. Mine is a, uh, it, it's the, the little drawer at the top of the desk where you're supposed to put pens and stuff. Uh-huh. And it'll only fit so many stories. And I had often said, I think on the show, that, that like the ideas would come up and they'd be like, hey, look at me, write me kind of a thing, you know, they're there and they're like, uh, you know, when they when they bubble back to the surface kind of a thing. And it, you know, I just had that kind of an image of like the ideas wanting to be written and, and somehow, yeah, that turned itself into this story where the ideas insisted upon being written and uh, fictional, completely fictional character of Garrett Tremblay. <laughs> learns to write because I didn't learn to write obviously I still haven't had my second bloody nose if I were Garrett Tremblay it's coming <laughs> and coming <laughs> okay well obviously I mean I know you fairly well as well as a man can know another man um but don't go there <laughs> like, oh geez announcer man have, have we even uh, commented on you today what do you call it we acknowledged you today announcer man no okay we will we will just hold on yeah it's coming up i i know you fairly well and it seemed like i recognized a bit of autobiography in this story yeah there's a lot of that that's one of those things it's kind of hard not to do you write what you know or whatever i guess if i remember right the whole freaking uh flash dance thing (laughs) I probably saw that movie within the month of having written this story. Uh, That may have even been the whole reason why the story was set in like 1983 or whenever it was. 
that I set it because I needed to make it so that Flashdance was new. So someone actually had a good reason to watch Flashdance because they don't have one now. I don't know why I saw that movie. If you don't achieve your dreams, you die. Right? Is that the quote from Flashdance? Yeah, if you give up on your dreams, you die. Okay, so you saw that movie and you were like, wow, that's inspiring. Those are inspiring words. <laughs> Not really. They were really, uh, you know, I mean, it could be inspiring, I guess. The movie itself is so uninspiring that it's hard to take anything from it. But, uh, you know, a, a, a sick stomach. They are remaking that, by the way, uh, this time with Willow Smith in the Jennifer Beale role, which is a lie. I just, <laughs> I hate it when I see Willow Smith's name on anything. What happened to that Annie remake? Did that go You know, away? she decided she didn't want to do it. She's like, don't make me do that, Dad. I want to be 11 or however old she is. So now uh, they are still making it. Um, Will Smith is still producing. Uh, I think there's even like a, a start date for it. But it's got the little nine-year-old girl from Beasts of the Southern Wild as Annie now. Okay. Still not that red afro that I was hoping for, but I guess they could No, but at least they got it. someone talented to play the part. Yeah. So I can color it. <laughs> um, but I mean, they've, they've tried this with like the Wiz. You remember that? And, and I, I, I'm trying to remember. There was another one. Oh, they, they did the Black Honeymooners. Do you remember that? No. But I, I'm willing to give him the benefit of that. Well, no, I'm sorry, Will Smith. It was a Will Smith vanity project for his daughter. How much doubt should I give them? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Wait, how the f***? Oh. I don't know. Moving on. Okay, Flashdance. Uh, I want to live forever. No, that's fame. What is the Flashdance song? They do. Yeah, they do have that song on there. That what a feeling! That's what, what that song. Is. Irene Cara, yes. And they also had. She's a maniac, maniac, maniac on the floor. floor, and she's dancing <laughs> like she's never danced before. Thank you, Casey, for reaching for the stars. Powerful words from Danny Trimbello. A long distance dedication <laughs> to a certain Garrett Tremblay <laughs> from Chandra with love. <laughs> okay, I couldn't do it with a straight face. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's funny that I even include... I've forgotten a lot of this stuff, actually. I mean, it's been two years since I wrote the story, so that happens, I guess. But yeah, I'd forgotten that I'd ever included Flashdance in a story. That I, yeah, wrote exactly about the feelings that I had for that movie. What a turd that thing <laughs> was, man. Just a string of music videos with very sparse story in between trying to link it together. But yeah, there was a couple other things. I think I even mentioned, you know, there's the part where he talks about how, oh, he'd seen fog like this before where he was on oh, right. the freeway. And I think I mentioned that on the show once where I was driving down the freeway and I didn't think I could find my exit to get off the freeway because the fog was so thick. Luckily, there was a auto dealership. Yeah. And th you recognized it as your auto dealership? I can no, get I, off. I think I just it lit up the place enough that I could find uh, an exit that way. But yes, yeah, stuff like that I, are really autobiographical. That, stuff like that that you experience and then you put into your stories. To me, that's one of the joys of being a writer or reading old things that I've written because it puts me black. puts me black. Sorry, Annie. It puts me back in that time and place and that mentality. You know, I can remember, oh, that's when I worked at so-and-so place. Or, oh, yeah, that's when... That was on the radio or whatever. I, you, you've noticed that you've even referred to it today. You know, a certain song that was playing on the radio. Oh, okay. Well, this must have been 1990 then, you know, that kind of thing. You discover it in your stories and it's a time capsule. You wouldn't write the same battle of the ideas today that you wrote in 2011 or 2010 when you wrote it. I mean, it maybe it'd be very similar, but there'd be different references and different wording and all that stuff and to me that's really cool i also do like a blog that that i just do for my family just like write about stuff that has happened to kind of help us remember these things in the future sometimes i'll go just go back for the heck of it and read old posts that i've done from like years ago and uh it's interesting because a lot of the times i'll have forgotten those particular events or forgotten the details of those particular events 
it's also funny just to read it and be like, wow, you know, this guy who wrote this blog, boy, it's like he's got the perfect sense of humor for me, you know? It's like this guy knows me so well. Every joke is like almost the same joke that I would do. It's just, wow. <laughs> but I don't remember writing the stuff, and I don't know. It's it's really interesting. It's kind of like this, you know. I, you know, I actually took a lot of time when I wrote this story. I tried really hard to prepare it um, more than I usually do. Usually what happens is I sit down and I start trying to prepare a story, you know, come up with a little bit, and then I get bored of trying to prepare it, and I just want to write it, and I start writing it, and often that'll lead to a story that never gets finished, like Sunny and Gray, you know, I, I did basically that. I didn't, I wasn't interested enough in trying to do the outline and trying to do the character bios and that kind of stuff. So you did start that story? I have started it, yeah, I started but that. But you abandoned it? I wrote, like, half of the first scene, and I haven't finished the first scene or anything I, I probably still could if I sat down and worked on it but uh, yeah with this particular story I forced myself to do the whole thing I wrote up the the entire outline I wrote up the character bios of his him and his wife and his friend and etc and some of the stuff I would have never come up with like the fact that his wife left him at the end of the story that was something that came out of the character bio when I came up with the idea that she was sleeping with the lawyer that she worked for. Uh, at first, that was just kind of, you know, that was just there. That was what she was doing, but you didn't... It wasn't ever even going to be a part of the story. It was just that she was a wench, and when she went out to play cards with her friends, she didn't go out to play cards with her friends. She went out to knock the boots with... with what was his name? Travis. Travis, the lawyer. Can you imagine a lawyer named Travis? <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't seem like somebody who's like, you've been in a fender bender? Call Travis. Well, maybe he's a more respected lawyer than that. He's not an ambulance chaser. He's a corporate attorney. Come on, this is Kansas City we're talking about. It's That's right, I know. It's the big city. So much about Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I actually did way more than I normally would on a story. And I think... That it shows. I don't know if you think that it shows or not, but uh, it seems like the story flows correctly, like the things happen at the right time and all that kind of stuff for it to really work. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe folks can <laughs> tell me what they thought. Hopefully be nice about it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I felt like I did a better job than I usually do. And then I think right after that, I fell back into my old habits and I haven't been able to rescue myself from back out of those habits since then really I keep trying to I keep trying to plan the story out like I mean to like I know that I need to but yeah I just I always lose steam before I can finish the prepping phase okay and when you know yourself you know what will work and what won't work so uh I mean I, I want to say stick to it but if you're not writing then Get on your Get way. Get on your way. That's right. The mountain, <laughs> it's just right there, man. It, it's, it's almost as though the mountain is waiting for something. Yeah. Uh, you Okay, so how long ago did you last read this story? Have well, you ever read this story? I have read it. Okay. Um, I think I read through it not too long after it was done to make sure everything was A-OK. -okay. And I know that I gave it to you and you read through it and gave me notes that I'm sure I went through and incorporated in when they were worthwhile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think I at least started to read through it when I was getting it ready to send out for, uh, or to print out for when we went to Las Vegas. But I must not have read all the way through it when we did that because there was way too much that was a surprise to me for me to have read it only two months ago. Well, I think we've, we've talked about that, that it's always good to put a story away and then, you know, let enough time pass that you've forgotten about it before you do your revisions or polish it to send out to somewhere. I, I don't know. But whatever works for somebody else. I, Dean Wesley Smith doesn't subscribe to that, right? Yeah, he says to send it out right away. I think that I might have to listen to him because what I tend to do, if I put it to way to let it mellow or whatever and so that I can go back and fix it later... I might as well just throw it in the trash because I don't ever go back to fix it later. 
you know, it just gets forgotten and never brought up again. Well, not this one. Yeah, I did manage to pull it out and use it on the show. Maybe that's the way I need to do it. Since we have a show and we're committed to putting our stories on it, that'll be a good way to force myself to get it back out and dust it off and make it look pretty. Right. And, well, you had the two characters that were both aspiring writers or both writers or whatever. And, and then there's one guy who seems to write a lot and not do anything with his writing. And there is another guy who doesn't seem to write all that much. But when he does, he learns something every time from, from the experience of writing. Well, where do you get your ideas? <laughs> I don't know. These guys are they're, they're, I, I just pulled, the, pulled them out of the ether. They're completely original <laughs> characters. But there's another autobiographical point to that story. You have said to me that every time you write a story, you learn something from it. From the process of writing, from putting thoughts from your brain onto wor- into words and then formulating those words into patterns and seeing what works and doesn't work, you learn something and you get better every time. Yeah, I, I think mean, that's the case. I think that's probably the case with anybody, though. Do you establish that in there? Do you wish that you had Chandra and On the other... On my lap, giving me kisses? Yes. Well, kisses in one hand, oh, uh, what's with punches the other hand? to the oh, face darn. in the other hand. <laughs> uh, if you had some kind of non-subtle reinforcement, uh, encouragement to write like that, would that be great? Or would you friggin' hate that? Well... I don't know. I don't know that I would want my life on the line for writing because it may be a dream that I've had for all my life, but my life itself is probably more important than fulfilling any particular dream. Life is but a dream. Oh, life is but a dream, sweetheart? Doo-doo. You know, I was thinking about the stuff that he does at the end where he tells his kid and tells his wife that this is his dream and tells his friend at work and tells Pablo to call him every night at nine or whatever, et cetera, et cetera. That's something that I ought to probably do. I've actually considered that just recently thinking, you know, have bringing my kids up and having them all sit down and telling them, you know, bug me every day. Ask me about this. Make me feel like I need to do it because I want to do it, but I let other things get in the way, et cetera. Well, one of the things that you said hopefully would inspire you was having this forum of the Dunstief where we don't just run other people's stories, but we are, are obligated. We've obligated ourselves to run our own stories as well. Mm-hmm. Because you said, if I know that the next slot is for me and there's nothing to fill that slot, I will force myself to write something for that slot, kind of like you did with uh, Unfortunate. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons we're doing this. Um, Your story this week, my story next week. Is it going to be a week? Well, uh, we'll have to see. (laughs) We are going to read your story next week when uh, you come around to record again. So maybe it will come together that quickly. If we can take something that we enjoy already, which is doing the stories on the show and then that listeners seem to enjoy because, we, you know, we've had people say, hey, when's the next episode? Or, oh, come on, what, well, you know, you guys said you were going to do this and you didn't do it. And that feels good. It, it's good to have, like you were saying, it's good to have somebody encouraging you or asking you about it or holding you responsible, holding you accountable is the word for this project of writing. And when, when the character in the book, or sorry, I, I guess I read it, said, you know, writing is hard says it like three or four times that sounded like me (laughs) because i've said it so many times on the show you know writing is hard it's hard (laughs) and and maybe i i do sound like i'm whining but because it's a challenge because it's difficult any little thing that helps make it easier or helps you know just knowing that somebody else wants to read what you've got or knowing that somebody else is expecting you to to shoulder your load has to help or it helps for me i'm not going to speak for you yeah it does uh, having something like that you know it's funny the last episode as we're recording this and i'm sure you know, there will be several episodes between now and then but the, as we're recording this the last episode that hit was wedded to bliss by rish outfield and uh, one of the comments that somebody put either on facebook or the um forum or i can't remember what twitter? wasn't twitter because it was a longer comment than twitter would allow but 
See, I didn't think there had been any comments on that story. There had been comments somewhere. It must have been Facebook or something. Or maybe it was just an email that somebody sent us. I can't remember. But somebody commented on it and they were saying, oh, yeah, the story was great. Thanks a lot for it. Good job, Rish. And Big Anklevich, come on. It's time for you to shoulder your port part of the bill. Come on and get some stuff written and get it out there, too, because we want to hear your stuff, too. Wait, Which, wait, this really happened? Yes. And that encouraged you or that motivated yeah. you to do what we're doing right now? Oh, uh, yeah, I think somewhat. I thought, well, I guess I need to make sure that we do one of my stories. And um, it really does, you know, work the way I was hoping it would work. And yeah, it's actually a new month. And the magic spreadsheet has started a new, or I don't know, maybe it doesn't start a new. I suppose it probably doesn't. If you have a 30-day chain, then your chain just keeps on going. But my chain is at zero right now. But my plan for April is to... Make that chain go. Make that chain. Chain. Make that chain. Shmow. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I'm going to try and get on it and make sure that I, I get that as well. Well, they, dude, that's good. Whoever, whoever posted that or commented that, thank you for a job well done. Neither of us have significant others that seem to demand that we write for them. And so it's sometimes it's hard to motivate yourself. So thank you for everybody that has motivated us. And uh, yeah, the, the, I don't know. I always thought that this was a, a, a good story that you wrote. Um, I remember you talking about the idea. I don't know if it was long before you wrote it, but you tend to do that. You'll, you'll say, Hey, I got an idea about just to use this as an example. I got an idea about a, 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 a girl that's not a girl. She's an alien in disguise. That, idea percolates in your head or whatever but does it help to have somebody say hey whatever happened to that idea about the the girl that that, that was an alien in disguise I, hey you said that one time but did you ever write that story does that help or does it make you feel guilty i think it totally helps because it will perhaps spur me on to actually write that i mean that happened to you once didn't it where you started an idea and then your crap top crashed on you or something and then like eight months later somebody's like hey how did this finish? I didn't, oh my gosh, what happened? You left me hanging. And you said, well, sorry, sir. I have no idea how it ends. I feel bad about that because I mentioned it on the show and I, I wonder if that guy heard it and it's just like, oh, well, F you, man. <laughs> because a real writer would say, well, thank you, sir, for liking that. I will finish that right now because you encouraged, you asked me about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Maybe if I were a better writer, I would... I w would be able to do that. You can go back and try it. I, I think I, I think I will. Because, yeah, I liked the idea for the story. Uh -huh. And he clearly did as well. I just let it die. Let it let it do whatever the, the rainbow man did <laughs> in this story. Yeah. The, let the, it, gotta, it get away. The cowboy dolly. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even realize what that was. <laughs> I was just thinking that the next idea that I want to try and work on, and I'm not sure if I've got a story for it yet, really, but I was listening to an old uh, outtake where we talked about our ideas for the Broken Mirror contest. And one of the ideas that I had that we didn't use, I was thinking, maybe I should write that story. I just need to come up with something beyond the premise, which I uh, came up with for the thing. Um, but yeah, it would be fun. That, and I just really need to get to work on Sunny and Gray while it's still there before it flees like the Rainbow Man. Well, folks, uh, if you're listening, encourage Big to write Sunny and Gray. It's something I hate to compare my writing style and your writing style. But if I had that much of a story as you do of Sunday and Gray, I think I would have written it by now. A lot of times I'm daunted because I don't know where I want it to go. Or, oh, geez. Uh, is this a good idea? I don't know if it's a good idea. <laughs> My inner voice is whiny like that. Kind of a male friend dresser, really. But if I have a story that's that <laughs> solid in my head, where I know where it's going to go, and I know that it's good, like you do for Sunday and Gray, you, that's usually motivation enough for me to to write it. So if you're listening to this and it's 2021, <laughs> please email or whatever you have in 2021. Please e shunt know. us. Yeah, e shunt big and say, hey, you know, you still haven't written Sunny and Gray because I know you. 
please write it. You know, I want to know what happens. Yeah, I, I definitely need to get to work on that while it's still fresh enough that I can. There's, yeah, lots of ideas that I've had where I've developed them and developed them and then I put them away and I haven't written them. And, you know, sometimes I come back to it years later and I realize that I knew a lot more about what was going to happen in the story at one point and I can't remember it well enough. I should have written it down or something because now it's actually fleeing it's not as clear as it once was, and uh, that's not cool. I guess the drawer isn't a bottomless drawer. It may be that uh, there are cracks in the drawer and some stories slip out, and you don't even realize how yeah. many have actually disappeared. The Rainbow Man went, and I don't even remember what the yeah, Rainbow Yeah, you don't Man even remember was. what that's supposed to represent. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is the last thing I'll say, and then I'll leave people alone to go about their lives. And if you're a writer out there, why don't you take a few minutes to write? But there's something magical about coming up with characters, coming up with a story, coming up with events, things to happen to these characters. I mean, you know, it's, it's essentially just playing pretend like you did when you were a child and just, you know, making up things, you know, two sticks and you pick them up. And what could these sticks be? lightsabers of course you know or they could be aliens that only look like sticks or they could be guns or, or i i don't know it just they could lightsabers be, they were lightsabers, they were lightsabers? you okay. know it and when you were a kid and you picked up two sticks they were lightsabers admit it i don't know i, I might have put the two <laughs> sticks together as a cross to ward off vampires or something like that because <laughs> that was a big part of my childhood but there is something magical about making up a story, creating a story and finding ways to tell it that, uh, like you said in the story, it's fun and it's work, but it is, it's, it's invigorating as well. And, uh, you know, I, I think artists of all, all, all different shapes, I almost said colors. What is wrong with me? They understand the magic of, I had an, a blank canvas and then it could have been anything that appeared on the canvas. And this is what, I created and now I can go get another blank canvas or like they used to, I can whitewash this canvas <laughs> and create a new image on top of it. And I think your story and my story are both about like the magic of that, of creating characters or, or, or situations that live on beyond you. That's not just, I mean, it is just what you created, but it feels like it's, it's something other than that. And then, like you said, with, with all the, I call them beasties. Well, the ideas in your head, you know, they're, they're just standing around waiting to be free, waiting to have the spotlight shined on them, waiting for their time in the sun. How many more? Say more cliches. There sir. must be a few. I don't know. That sort of thing is neat. The discovery of something that's within yourself, but you didn't know it was there. That's magical. That's the wonderful thing about... Uh... Tiggers, you know. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for, thanks for encapsulating my thought for me. That is the wonderful thing about creating things is that, uh, <laughs> is that yeah, it's, it's almost like you get to play God for a little while. You get to have this, ma this great power. You can create people. You can create events. You can create things. You can create all sorts of amazing things when you do something creative. You know, it just takes a little bit of work, a little bit of trying hard. Because I was reading a book, and it's about weight loss, not about... But there's some similar principles in both of them. Because an important thing in losing weight is consistency, which is also an important thing in writing. Consistency is what's going to make you into a better writer. It's going to make you have that habit and there's been a few th each time I see thing I keep seeing things in this book and I'm actually highlighting them and trying to remember them because they really really apply to writing but yeah one of the things that he talks about is integrity his definition of integrity is fulfilling the things that you told yourself you would do you told yourself right then you can take it you know once you start doing what you tell yourself you you would do then you can go beyond that and start living up to all the things that you say you would do to others and so forth but first of all you have to do what you say to yourself you would do and you know obviously he's talking more about not stuffing your face with cake or something but uh, you know you're the one that's in charge 
I, it's you. I, I, you know, I can see that because writing is such a solitary thing. And I mean, exercising, you can go to a gym and be around a ton of people or let people know, hey, I'm exercising. Don't let me eat that or whatever. But if you really want to eat it, you can go somewhere where no one will see and no one will ever know and all that. And the same thing with writing. I, you know, I, I can just not do it and no one will ever care whether I do it or not today. Uh, it's only you that's going to hold you accountable for what you do today. So I can see the connection. You flabby bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you flabby unwriting bastard. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I've been trying to put those together, kind of work on both at the same time. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Well, you go jogging every morning, which again, I'll never stop saying this. Blows my mind. I, I, do you think about writing while you're running? Does, does that help you? I do sometimes. Yeah, I'll think about stories. I actually had a story idea come to me while while I was jogging. Okay, that see, that's awesome. A, a decade ago, when I lived in L.A., I fell for this stupid girl. And I th- thought to myself, self, if you can get in shape, then she's going to like you. I, I don't know. Youth is naive, I guess. And so I started jogging and, and my, my deal was every night cause I'm not a morning person and I would jog every night, whether I wanted to or not, because I had this motivation, this dumb infatuated motivation. And I found that every time I went jogging, I would think about story ideas. I would think about, Oh, oh and, and sometimes even as tired and out of shape as I continued to be day after day, I would run home you know, I would see the, the apartment building and I'd just give it all I had to get home so I could write because <laughs> I had this idea and oh my gosh, this is going to be so good. If I, I can just go, if I weren't running right now, <laughs> I would be able to write it. And I know that had I not gone and done the exercise regimen, I would have been watching TV or surfing the internet or sleeping or, or one, any number of other things I would have been doing. But because I was out there exercising my body, somehow it exercised my mind as well. It it seems to do that sometimes. I used to do years ago when I was younger, like you were years ago. Um, weird, weird that. <laughs> I used to just go out and walk around at night just to think about stories. I would just walk the neighborhood and peek in people's windows and uh, think about stories. <laughs> we are brothers, you know that? It was great for thinking about stories. I would just think on them all the time as I go for walks. I, I sometimes wish that I had more time to be able to do that kind of a thing, to just go out for a walk by myself. I think what I need to do is get a dog. I've got a stupid cat. Cats don't go for walks, especially not with people. Sometimes you open the door and they run out, and then like one second later, they're scratching on the door wanting to get back in. And then they want back out a second later after that. But if I had a dog, you know, you have to take a dog for a walk. So it's like a good thing to... I've heard... In many ways, you know, they say that pets are really good for health because, I mean, like you have a dog, you have to take it for a walk. So people who have dogs tend to be more healthy than people that don't because they go for walks. But having a dog, like I used to do that all the time when I was younger, and I did have a dog when I was growing up. I had two different dogs, and I would have to take them for walks. And I thought about stories and writing and all that kind of stuff all the time as I would go for walks with my dogs. Um, maybe I need to do that. Well, Give myself maybe, a dog. Maybe you should say to your wife, wife, in our next house, let's have a dog. Yeah, we'll definitely have to do that. The thing you said is, I wish I had more time, you know, to do that. You never will. Yeah, Nobody ever will. I mean, you could be, you could win the lottery and not have to work, but you'd still find things that steal your time, that steal your energy and all that stuff. Uh, just the same as this poor guy at the auto shop where he worked. Um, If it's not one thing, it's another. And yeah, like you said, you just have to make yourself go for a walk. I mean, it doesn't have to be for an hour, you know, find a few minutes here and there. The same thing with the writing. Well, that's something that the magic spreadsheet helped me with is there were so many times I didn't want to write because, you know, everybody has times they don't feel like it. But but because I had an obligation and because it's a public thing and because I knew that, well, 
you at least were competing with me on there, I, I would do it. And, and I, I wish that you would too. It would be awesome if you were gloating and you'd be like, look how many <laughs> points I have and how few points you have. Because I, you know, I'm not a competitive person with, with anything, really. I'm one of those people that shies away from competition. But it seems like this is something that I, I'm really good at. And so it would be a good competition, I guess. I, I don't know. It does help to compete at things that you're good at. That's why I didn't play basketball very much growing up because I sucked at basketball. Hmm. But I played football because I didn't suck at football. Compete at those things that you're good at. Yeah, I, I just played with myself, really, because okay. that's something I... That was what you were good at? just makes... Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, Michael Phelps doesn't run track. <laughs> he does swimming because that's what he's good at. Same kind of thing. So... Next week, or next time, I should say, we have another story that's of a similar vein. It even also has ideas in the title. <laughs> it will be by Senor Rich Outfield. Yeah, we'll try and get that one on as close to this one as possible so you can compare and contrast. It's almost like a little broken mirror thing, huh? It is, although they were written years and years apart, so they didn't really have anything to do with one another, but they really do go together well. Uh, I mean, it's been... Since back when you still lived in L.A., I think that you wrote this story. And uh, I don't know if I saw this story before you moved out here, but I think I did. I think I saw this story when I still lived in California as well. <laughs> so it's been around for a while. But, yeah, it's always been one of my favorites. It's one that I've really enjoyed. So I think that y'all listening out there are in for a treat next week. So stick around for part two of the Ideas Marathon. <laughs> All right, I like that. Okay, well, thanks for listening, everybody. And yes. have a good time until next time. All right, why not? <laughs> All right. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. What? An answer, man. Looks like we're out of time. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files.